large format cinematography. Uh, from the buyer's point of view, uh, we have a, a great uh, lineup of guests, practically every major manufacturer in the business. Uh, and I've lined them up in alphabetical order, starting with my friend uh, Jean-Marc Bouchou from Ingenue. Um, uh, Ari is uh, represented by uh, Art Adams, who's uh, new to the company, and uh, welcome to Los Angeles. He's just moved down here from the Bay Area. Uh, for Canon, we have uh, Michael Bravin. Uh, for Cook, we have the infamous uh, Les Zillin. <laughs> uh, Stotch Durbans from uh, Fujinon. Uh, Rainer uh, Herscher from uh, Lights and um, uh, from PNS Technic. We have uh, uh, Anna uh, Piffle. And uh, I should uh, just mention and uh, uh, give my condolences to Anna, her uh, father, Ali, uh, who was a terrific guy. I met him last year uh, when I visited uh, Munich. He passed away recently. Uh, next, we have uh, from Schneider Optics, uh, Adam Beck. Uh, Adam is a cinematographer, not uh, exactly uh, representing the company, uh, but uh, I like that. He's, uh, he's a user of the lenses, and uh, he's going to tell us about his experience with uh, Schneider Optics. Uh, from uh, uh, Sigma, we have uh, Jared Ivey. Uh, from Tokina, we have uh, Ryan Avery. And last but not least, we have uh, Christoph uh, Kazanov uh, from Zeiss. Like I mentioned, most of our events are um, based on something that I want to find out about. And I'm an equipment owner, and uh, I'm very interested in uh, lenses because uh, cameras don't last very long. Uh, cinema lenses uh, don't become obsolete. Um, I've had some for 30 years, and they're vintage, so now they're even better, you know, better value, better quality. But something that's disturbing that is that they're starting to become all large format. And my, lens, my old lenses don't cover that anymore. So that could be an, uh, you know, an issue. And I always have to try to keep up with that. So we're going to be uh, especially looking at the large format today. And we're going to look at um, also uh, anamorphic. And uh, judging by the crowd, uh, I think that there are other people here that are interested in lenses. It's about um, a value. So when I ask each of you um, to tell us about your lenses, I'd also like the bad news which is the price. If you give me the price range, I think that's always uh, uh, interesting. Uh, we'd also like to find out about coverage area, the speed, the metadata. Let's start out with uh, Jean-Marc, and if you could keep your uh, opening remarks brief, then we can have some time for uh, Q&A at the end. Okay, thank you, James, for getting hit by a panel. I think every year it's really a pleasure to be uh, talking about uh, optics. Uh, so, I think I try to be quick, but uh, this year we have a lot of things to say. Uh, you probably heard last week we introduced a new series of lenses, that's prime lenses. Uh, engineer has been really well known for the zoom lenses, especially the Optimo, which have been around for uh, close to 20 years. Uh, we have been making primes a long time ago, as was in the 1950s, and we were really the first one to make primes for reflex camera when Pierre Engineer invented the retrofocus. And uh, basically in the 1960s, we were so busy make, making zoom, so we decided to really focus our activity on zoom. But uh, with a new format, with a new potential of uh, making uh, you know, unique lenses, we decided to jump into the prime business. So uh, new primes are called the Optimo primes. We really wanted to use the, the brand name, the, the name of the Optimo, uh, the look of the Optimo. Uh, they are going to be very uh, light and compact. Uh, most of them are around like uh, 3.7, 3.8 pounds, except the wide and the tele, which will be around like uh, 4.5 to 5 pounds. Uh, that's a series of 12 lenses running from 18 millimeter uh, to 200 millimeter. Uh, most of them are fast, uh, T18, except the wide and tele, which will be around two T2. Um, one of the unique things we wanted to create on these primes uh, was uh, customization. 
We uh, talked to a lot of DPs, top DPs, uh, Academy One nominated DPs. We talked to uh, also local rental house here in, in uh, Hollywood, but also in Europe. And they told us a lot of clients want something different. When we shoot a movie, when we shoot a commercial, they want to look to be different. So one day we want vintage look, one day we want something uh, more clean, more uh, just uh, like a classic. Uh, so in order to do that, we designed these primes to be uh, customable. So we have uh, option to uh, change the iris uh, with different options for iris blade. We have a rear element that can be replaced. It's like a flat element, so you can use a filter, you can use a spherical element. And we have also a smart optics inside of, a, inside of a lens that can be replaced, so can be used as a support for uh, shims, glue, something like that, that people are using right now to create flair. So it's really a, like a base product that can be really customized uh, depending on the, the need of a cinematographer. Uh, and what's the bad news? What's the bad news? The price, I can't really give you an exact price because we have a... You know, contract with Band Pro, so that they are the ones who are providing the price. But uh, you know, just uh, ask Band Pro, and they uh, they can give you you know an idea how much it costs. The idea is really to to get the price as more as must uh, as we can competitive, and uh, yeah. But the the creativity is really important. Um, uh, talking about full frame, we have also the easy lenses that we designed a few years ago that are really in full production right now. Uh, they are super 55 lenses and a uh, full frame, so you can adapt uh, the, the lens depending on the format you are using with your camera and, and uh, optimize the lens for the T-stop and uh, uh, field of view uh, for your camera by replacing the rear, uh, depending on uh, just the format you are using. And also, um, a 12 to 1 Optimo, uh, the new version, the Ultra, uh, has been around for close to one year right now. And uh, it's available now, uh, full frame. We just uh, deliver the first one to cast low right before uh, NAB. Um, so there is few available uh, as a full frame option in the US and around the world. And um, anamorphic also, we uh, released last year uh, 42 to 420, a 10 time anamorphic zoom. Uh, that's really also fast and, uh, and sharp and uh, pretty light. Uh, it's uh, really uh, like a 16 pound lens for 10 times zoom, uh, T45. And that lens is also available um, at the local rental house here in Hollywood. Okay, that's all we have time for, so thank you all for coming. No. <laughs> the rest of you can keep it a little shorter. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, my, uh, my name is Art Adams. Uh, until last December, I was a DP. I had freelanced for about 26 years, and I was a camera assistant for about five years before that. I am now cinema lens specialist at Airy. Um, about a year ago, I ran into the gentleman who designed the color science for the Alexa camera, uh, the original Alexa cameras, and well, and all the cameras since. And I asked him what was the philosophy behind the look of the airy look. And he said, well, we wanted to capture the essence of film. We, wanted, we didn't want a camera that looked like a Kodak film stock or an Akba film stock or a Fuji film film stock. We wanted uh, a camera that people could look at and say, this is film. It doesn't look like a particular kind of film, but it captures the essence of film. So you know that it's filmic, but it's not so specific that you can really put your finger on which manufacturer it might have come from. And when I first started talking to the product manager for this um, set of lenses, the Signature Primes, uh, Torsten Maywald, I asked him the philosophy. And his answer was very similar. He said, um, it's very easy to create a technically perfect lens but those are boring. Uh, I wanted to create a lens that captured the, uh, the characteristics of classic lenses that I've appreciated over time, a combination of both still and cinema lenses. And that's effectively what we've tried to do with these lenses. We call them high performance classic lenses. The idea is that the science is cutting edge. Uh, we are an engineering company, so we tend to do things uh, at pretty much the edge of what can be done. But we also have designed these lenses to be very uh, beautiful in a way that is, in a way, timeless. The look is not so strong that I think in 10 or 20 years you're going to be able to look back and say, oh yeah, this was shot in you know, 2018, 2019. Sort of the same way I can watch a 1980s TV show and say, oh yeah, that was shot in about 1984. I can really pinpoint that look. Um, 
I worry a little bit that some of the lenses we're using now, when HDR kicks in, we're going to be able to look back from 10 years from now and say, oh, yeah, 2015 to 2020, I remember that era. Lens flares, uh, uh, lots of flare, veiling glare, distortions, things that may not look the greatest in UHD and HDR, but look great right now. What we've tried to do is create a lens that captures kind of the essence of what cinematographers appreciate in lenses, but without being so overpowering that you're going to be able to say, this is a lens from a specific era. Uh, so they're very high resolution, but low micro contrast. So the skin tone doesn't pop. It looks very real. You see all the detail. You see all the texture, but it's not accentuated. Um, the lenses are a little bit on the warm side. They're low contrast. Uh, they don't breathe. Um, the, it's startling how little they breathe. There's very low chromatic aberration. The goal is to kind of capture the, the warmth of a classic lens and the, the perception of, of um, the resolution of a classic lens without actually eliminating resolution. We capture all the resolution that's available. It just doesn't feel overly sharp or contrasty. Um, I mean, these really are designed for HDR and UHD, but also to capture what people have appreciated in classic lenses, but without creating a look that's so strong it won't work in HDR or UHD. Uh, we also have the new LPL mount, which has a number of advantages. We can talk about that later if yeah. you want, but I'm, I'm going to pass I'm going to ask right you a now. question about that. And um, if you have to ask, you can't afford it, right? 25000 mid-range each. Uh, the ends are about forty, but they're near telecentric, and we can talk more about that too, but the idea is that they'll work with any foreseeable sensor design. They're optimized for digital sensors in a way that a lot of PL lenses aren't. Uh, we invented the PL lens for 35 millimeter cameras. Uh, it's obsolete now. We've tried to come up with something better, uh, and we hope the industry adopts it because it really we think it makes lens design easier, and it also allows you to use any lens on any camera. There's a, there's a PL adapter, so you can still use PL lenses on LPL mounts. Uh, it just opens up the field so that if you have a large format lens, you can use it on a large format camera or a small format camera or anything in between. So that's the idea. And pass the mic. Oh, here's mine. Cool, thanks. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Michael Bravin, and I'm the director of Ken Burbank, and I'm here today to represent the Sumi Ray Primes. Um, the way it's pronounced is Sumi Ray. It's a Japanese word that describes a um, flower that's very much like a violet. And the design of the name, along with the lenses, is that as you open the lens, it becomes more beautiful. So what, what these are, mechanically, is very similar to our CNE primes. Um, but optically, uh, over the last three or four years, the lens engineers uh, came and interviewed several, probably 100 uh, cinematographers to find out, well, what is it that you'd like to have? Um, most of the people said they'd like to have a new set of K35s um, because those lenses have become very popular. Um, because of the materials used and the coatings used and lead and all sorts of things that you can no longer use to manufacture glass in a lens, um, it wasn't possible to do that, but it was possible to make a lens that has a very aesthetically pleasing, characteristic look that's not, that's while it's high resolution for 4K, sense, 4K and 8K sensors, it's not um, overly sharp. It's very pleasing in the skin tones, and it has a very unique bokeh. Um, for those of you that are interested, to, tonight at 5.30, we're going to be showing some footage shot with the lenses in the Paramount Theater. Um, the, the range of lenses is uh, seven focal lengths, like the CNE. We have a 14, a 20, 24, 35, 50, 85, and 135. Um, common 114 millimeter front, and a, a first for Canon is PL mount prime lens. Um, What's the price range? Oh, the price range. Uh, $7,410 each. No, the, the uh, 14 is a 2.8. The, the 20, 24, and 35 are 1.3. The 50s are 1.5. Uh, 85s 1.5, and the 135 is a 2.2. Thanks. Uh, I'm Les Zellin from Cook. Um, in infamous, is that what it is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Oscar winner. <laughs> yeah, that too. Um, 
we, we, Cook has developed, more, I think, more series of lenses than just about anybody here. Of recent note, uh, <coughs> last two years ago, we introduced the S7s, which were the, our first full-frame spherical lenses. Uh, then uh, last, this year at NAV, or no, last year at IVC, we introduced the, uh, our anamorphic full-frame lenses that, that we're going to start, that we just started to deliver uh, this month. Uh, so we are racing ahead. Uh, all of our anamorphic lenses, including the zooms we make, are front anamorphic, and that's a that is an important disti distinction. Uh, to get the anamorphic look, you have to do the anamorphic work in front of the iris, and so all of our lenses, primes and zooms, are front anamorphic. Um, we have spent. Um, I can't even re read my notes anymore. How about that? Uh, anyway, uh, we spent a long time developing a metadata system called Slash I, which most people at this table are I technology partners. And uh, uh, I think in the next year or two, uh, metadata, which is becoming important, will hit the critical mass and it will become extremely useful in production. Uh, we we're finally putting all the tools together with the help of the partners here. Uh, and uh, that'll make it a really important tool to the industry. So for all the eye technology partners here, I thank you for participating. Um, I don't want to talk too long because I can go on for hours, uh, but I'd like to get to your questions, so I will pass the mic along. Oh, I didn't give you the bad news. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Bad news is um, the Cook S7s are in dollar terms, the low 20s, and the, uh, the full-frame anamorphics are in the low 30s. Uh, thank you, Les. Uh, my name is Stash. I'm with uh, Fuji Films uh, Optical Device um, Division Fujinon uh, brand zoom lenses. Uh, before I start, I want to make sure everyone's aware. We're super excited tomorrow to, to premiere the first film, short film shot with the uh, new Promista lens. It'll be at 11.30 in the Paramount Theater. Uh, please all come. Uh, check it out. There will also be a panel. Uh, Tobias Scheisler, ASC, who shot the film uh, and directed by uh, Aisha Scheisler uh, and the lead um, actor will all be on a panel discussing their experiences uh, using this new lens. Um, what we've done is uh, launched uh, the first uh, series of uh, large format zooms from Fuji. We call them Promista. Where Promista comes from is it's the um, premier level, if you're familiar with our HK series, uh, certainly the um, uh, premier line of zoom lenses. So the premier uh, quality optical performance match with a VistaVision image circle size. Uh, match those words together and we get Promista. Um, the design, uh, in, in speaking with the industry, we spent a lot of time over the last couple of years speaking to rental houses and, and directors of photography and, and users of the lenses. Uh, and to camera manufacturers, we determined that it was important for us to have uh, a 46.3 mil image circle so we can cover all the current crop of uh, large format camera sensors out there. We felt it very important to be fast, so we needed a T-stop that started with a two that would help enable uh, the users of the zoom lens to, to take advantage of those shallow depths of field that the larger format cameras uh, provide. Uh, from there, uh, we challenged the factory to build something that was as small and lightweight as, as possible. Uh, we felt that it was important to provide a tool that was going to continue to provide uh, crews with that versatility on set where they could use it um, in, in a number of different setups and rigs and, and fly it on, on the various um, uh, tools that they use today uh, on set. So with that, um, Promista was born. Uh, it's 8.4 pounds. It has a T-stop at 2.9, so they just slid it in there. Uh, it does start with a 2. Uh, the first one that, uh, that uh, is here on the table is the 28 to 100 mil. Uh, it has a 114 mil front barrel, so you're into your smaller map boxes and filters. It does have a 280 degree barrel rotation on the focus side. You have lots of real estate for your marks. Uh, it does come uh, stock with the encoders and the uh, Cook slash I metadata, as well as uh, you can see on the side an extended data port there as well. Uh, there is a sister lens that we uh, announced that will ship uh, later in the year. It'll be the exact same size, the exact same weight, the same gear placements from the camera, so your lens changes on set are nice and quick. 
uh, same front diameter. Uh, you don't need to rebalance things. It's uh, an 8250, also a 2.9. Uh, it will uh, roll off to 3.5 at the, the tele end of that lens, uh, but it will hold 2.9 to 200 mil. Uh, there is a new 13 blade iris design in there, so we have nice, round, beautiful bokehs. Uh, I encourage you to come by our booth, check out the, the 28 to 100. It's on a uh, on the camera there. And again, tomorrow uh, at the Paramount Theater, 11.30. Uh, the bad news on this one's not so bad. Uh, as compared to our, our premier level uh, zooms, the 28 to 100 uh, carries a list price of 38, uh, $38,800. The tele version will be $1,000 more at 39.8. Thank you. My turn, okay. It's Rainer, I'm uh, with Light um, from Germany. We are in the large format sector for quite some time. We started two years ago with our Thalia primes. Um, with those one, we cover 65 millimeter Alexa, so it's a 60 millimeter image circle. That one is shipping since two years. Um, we also started most recently with our new primes, which is just called Simple Lights Primes. And according to that, we have the light zooms. Um, all these lenses are fairly new. I could talk a lot about technical specs, but that would take quite a long time. So I think the best is come to the booth and take a look at them. Um, all of our large format glass um, support slash I that we happily um, that we happily joined together with Cook. And apart from that, um, regarding prices, and it's a lot of primes, I would say all our primes are really affordable and a real good investment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm Anna um, with P and S Technik. Um, thank you for the introduction. My father founded the company about 30 years ago, and I'm very thankful for the time I could spend with him, and that uh, more than 20 years I could work with him. Um, he was very excited and inspired for um, cinema lenses and um, cinema um, products in general. So I, I brought two um, products uh, for you today. Um, for the uh, large um, sensors. Um, one is, um, as, as uh, you probably know, we do lens rehousing for several years now. And we do rehouse um, still photography lenses that cover the larger formats. I brought you here one sample. Um, we have more in, in the booth. And um, what uh, the good thing about is that it helps you save your investment that you uh, have made in lenses some time ago. And uh, we um, strive to help you to continue use those lenses, keep them in a good state. Um, we offer extended uh, service for um, lenses, um, um, like cleaning, refurbishing, but also customization. We, uh, we polish and recode lenses. We can uh, customize. Um, many many features on the lenses that we rehouse, and we offer a um, wide range of rehousings for still photography lenses and vintage lenses. Um, the other lens I brought for you is uh, called Technovision Classic. That's the name of the the lens series. Um, I I think um, several of you remember Technovision lenses. They are an iconic lens series um, that was um, built uh, from the 70s uh, to the, the 90s by Technovision Rome. Um, these lenses have been used for, or are still uh, in use for many feature films. And my father had a, um, a great relationship with the Technovision company and um, Harald Bukunik, who is also here. Um, and. Um, when we um, finished our other lens project, the Evolution 2X lenses, um, they got together and said they, they, we have to continue the, this iconic lens um, system. And the result is the Technovision Classic lenses. At this cine gear, um, we have um, um, uh, one zoom lens and uh, four prime lenses in our boost. Um, in, in uh, later this year, there uh, will be another zoom lens and um, another wide-angle prime. On the, um, on the price point, um, the rehousings are um, starting around 3,000 euro. 
did that. That depends really on the focal length, on the condition of the, the lens, and um, the glass service we should do for you, the customization. But uh, many things are possible. Uh, just contact us uh, with your questions, and we try to help you. The Technovision lenses, the primes are around um, um, uh, 20,000 euro, and the zoom lenses are in the mid-20s. OK, thank you. So Adam, why do you invest in Schneider Optics? What do you love about them? Uh, the consistency, uh, size, shape, weight, uh, the 35 to the 100 or within an ounce. And I think the 25s an ounce more. And then I think uh, the 18 is probably maybe half a pound, eight ounces heavier. So putting on a, a gimbal or a drone, um, just quick changes. It just, it, it's a good advantage of it. Uh, they're versatile um, in the sense that, uh, you know, we've got different lens mounts. Uh, you know, there's an EF mount, there's an E mount, and an F mount for Nikon, and also a PL mount. So uh, the look is aesthetically pleasing. So to me, it's uh, the, has a nice creamy look to it. It's also got uh, the skin tones render, rendition is pretty good. Rendering is pretty good. Sorry about that. Um, I would also say that uh, I mean there are some drawbacks. There is some CA issues with it, in all honesty. So um, it's a it's an issue they know they are aware of, and hopefully we get it fixed in the future. But uh, the T stops are T21 from a 25 to 100, and then the 18 is a 24. And so they're not uh, super fast, but the, it's more of a standard speed. And um, it uh, has a, uh, the sharpness is really nice. It's not overly, overly critically sharp uh, in the sense that uh, you're gonna have to put a lot of diffusion on, but um, I still use diffusion with them as well, so. Do you know what the price range is? Yes, uh, it's part of the lenses, or most of the lenses are about the $3,500 range, and then the 18, 25, or more, five to $6,000. Very economical. And Jared, can you tell us about uh, Sigma? Uh, yes, so um, you know, Sigma's been uh, in the optics game for uh, almost 60 years, uh, but, but new to making lenses specifically for Cine. Uh, it really was the, uh, the filmmaking community that kind of pulled Sigma into manufacturing Sigma lenses uh, because of the fantastic success with Sigma's art series uh, on the still side. Um, many filmmakers were uh, having the lenses rehoused uh, for the mechanics uh, to use with, uh, with cinema cameras. Um, as they did uh, market research, they realized that there, you know, there definitely was a market for the type of uh, optics that they were making. Um, I would say that the, the best description um, I've heard, I've heard Sigma called a lot of things, but I think the best description as far as the look goes is, is pristine. Um, you know, their, uh, you know, Sigma's goal when making the art series of lenses on the, on the still side was to make the highest quality lens possible, but keeping them at a, at a reasonable price. And they definitely checked a lot of boxes as far as, um, you know, uh, being able to resolve, um, a lot of pixels, being able to, um, have minimal distortion, um, you know, just the right amount of, of ghosting and flaring, contrast, saturation, um, you know, but of course on the cine side, that's not what everybody's looking for. Um, you know, each, each project is going to, um, is going to uh, call for a, a certain look, um, but if that is something that uh, you know that, that you're looking for in your project, um, you know, Sigmas are definitely um, a, a good a good option to look at. Um, going into the Cine market, uh, we initially had um, you know five primes that were full frame, one full frame zoom, and two super 35 zooms. Uh, since then, you know we've expanded to uh, we now have ten full frame primes ranging from 14 T uh, T2 um, up to uh, 135. Um, and recently, in the last year, we've come out with a, a 28 T1.5, a 40 T1.5, and a 105 T1.5. Um, as far as technical specs, uh, you know, to uh, keep this <laughs> keep this short, you can find out more information at uh, sigmacine.com. Uh, if you're at Cine Year, please stop by our booth. Um, or if you're in the greater Los Angeles area or going to be visiting, uh, we now have a showroom um, and service center in Burbank. Um, we, where you can come Monday through Friday, uh, test out any of our products, uh, and we also have a service center on site as well. Thank you. Thanks. I'm uh, Ryan Avery from Tokina. I'm here with the uh, Tokina Vista Primes. Uh, Tokina has been on the um, still manufacturing side and uh, supply of glass to cinema manufacturers for a number of years. Uh, about three years ago, they decided to manufacture a line, a ground-up line of VistaVision speed lenses. So these are the Vista Primes. Um, they are T1.5. Uh, they have very limited chromatic aberration at T1.5. They are usable at that T-stop. 
Uh, they have uh, nearly zero focus breathing. They have an uh, area of definition for vista vision, so slightly larger than full frame, but the light circle is on most of them is closer to 60 millimeters, so it'll cover Alexa 65. Um, they are, they've seen a lot of wide market adoption. Uh, we had a, uh, announced a partnership with Panavision. Panavision now rents these lenses, um, and they chose them, uh, in their words, for their freeform design. So they are a very um, high resolution lens, very clean look, but they have a design that is designed more closely to match the human eye. So there's a lot of roll off between uh, the point of focus and uh, the depth of field. So it's a very pleasing look. Uh, this new one is the standard Vista primes are black. This new one is a gray color because it's a single coated prime and these are called the Vista One. They're a limited edition release that we did. Um, we announced it in AB and uh, we sold out in four hours. So uh, we think people like them. They are a very low contrast uh, lens. So it's a different look, but it still get, retains the resolution. And that came from people asking us, they really like the look of the Vista Primes, but they said we want a little less contrast and a lot more flare. So if you like a blue color flare and less contrast, the Vista Ones are it. Um, and uh, the bad news is the Vista Primes are about uh, $6,000 a piece and the Vista One are $9,000 a piece, although the Vista Ones are only sold as a set of six. 18 to 105 for both ranges, all T1.5, and we're adding at least four more focal lengths in the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I will make short. <laughs> um, I'm Christophe, uh, working with size. Um, I don't need to present the company, I think. Um, we are here with a different um, line of lenses. Uh, we have been probably one of the first uh, company believing in, in large format. The, uh, this panel is about large format, I think. <laughs> So we started already 10 years ago with very affordable large format lenses. Then we developed the cinema zooms, also large format. And uh, last year, we added um, a new line, Supreme Prime. Um, I will not talk a lot about the look, because I think uh, the look is something that you uh, that you need to, to check and test. And either you like it or you don't like it. And perhaps today you like it. Or tomorrow you don't like it anymore. So everybody has his opinion because here in cinematography, it's about emotion. So I will not try to describe the look. It's, uh, it's a size lens. Uh, some people will find some touch of the old super speeds that are still very uh, in love because nothing gets obsolete in this market. Super speed are still not obsolete. Uh, also, all the lenses from size that people uh, like a bit less because perhaps they are too sharp. So um, um, an interesting thing as well is, uh, and, and thank you also less uh, to mention this, we are a proud partner of, of Cook slash I. So thank you to, to also to offer us this possibility. So we believe a lot in metadata. Uh, so we integrated the uh, Cook slash I inside uh, the, those lenses and uh, we, we want also to help develop uh, and, and extend this uh, this technology. So we added some additional data that are interesting for VFX because VFX is the uh, next or is everywhere and simplifying the VFX workflow is for us also very important. If we can add our small uh, stone, step stone in uh, simplifying the workflow of the cinematographer and the whole production team, uh, we are happy with this. So the Supreme Prime and all our lenses are, uh, can be uh, seen here at our booth, but also we, also another thing, we uh, opened a showroom uh, in Chairman Oaks in, uh, in the area. So uh, whoever wants to uh, test uh, lenses, whatever, we have also uh, Master Primes, we have Master Anamorphic, we have uh, Supreme Primes, uh, CP3, um, just book, uh, you can you can book a, a private uh, appointment there. And we have our colleague can let you try the lenses in a very nice environment. So please use this possibility. It's quite easy and uh, convenient. And I think you'll have fun there. But I think now it's time for questions, right? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to start by asking a few. Um, so Art, I mentioned that I would get back to you about um, uh, mounts. And I know that. Uh, 
uh, Ari invented the PL, and now you're going to LFL. Uh, but tell us about the adapters and how it works going back and forth and how we can use some of our legacy lenses. Well, um, should I explain why LPL is a good thing? Please. Okay. So uh, we set out to design these lenses from scratch and, and looked at what would we do if we weren't constrained by a mount. And what we came up with was this new larger diameter mount with a reduced flange depth. Uh, reducing the flange depth makes optical design a bit easier. Uh, and there wasn't any reason to stick to 52 millimeters anymore because there's no mechanical shutter as you would find in a film camera anymore. So there wasn't any point in retaining that distance. Um, these lenses are near telecentric, and what that means is that when the light exits the lens, it's coming out at a fairly shallow angle. Um, if you have a PL mount lens and you're trying to light up a large sensor, uh, the light has to come out at fairly steep angles. So what we did was we looked at moving the exit pupil, which is the point through which light has to pass to get out of the lens, and it's, it's the image of the aperture blades as viewed through the back of the lens. Try to move that as far forward as possible. So actually, let me look at this lens. 35 and the 47 are the best ones. But yeah, yeah, this one's good. Um, the aperture appears to be actually slightly in front of the lens. The aperture looks to be right. Aperture looks to be right at the front of the lens. It's not, but that's where it appears to be. So what happens is that the light has to exit through that point in order to get out of the lens. The angle is very much like this. So if the back of the lens is as big as the sensor is, and it's effectively emanating from the front here, then you've got a very shallow angle. And that's optimal for sensor design because sensors don't like being hit with light at extreme angles. You get all sorts of, you can get color crossover and color fringing and some other weird effects um, based on sensor design and also the cover glass uh, in front of the sensor, which is, you know, it, it has thickness and it, it has an impact. It has an optical impact. And you want to try to get through all that as dead on as you possibly can. So that's the idea behind why the LPL mount came to be. Uh, the adapter uh, basically just fits right into the LPL mount. It takes PL mount lenses. It's, it's rock solid. And it puts the lenses back out at 52 millimeters. The LPL uh, flange depth is 44 millimeters. So we designed it in, uh, with backwards compatibility in mind. And it's, it's a very robust system. You actually get more coverage out of the PL to LPL adapter than you do through the actual PL mount because the, the standard PL mount has a little window in it designed to cut down stray light. That's not in the adapter. So you'll actually get more large format coverage through the PL adapter than you would through a regular PL mount. So that's the idea. We're trying to get the industry to adopt it just because you know, we invented the PL mount. We think it's obsolete. It's our mess. We, <laughs> we're the only company that makes both cameras and lenses. We figure, well, it's our job to clean this up. And if we can make Michael a Michael takes exception to that. <laughs> <laughs> but and, but um, we, we decided that this was the best path to take, not for, just for us, but uh, for the industry. So we actually released the, I mean, the, the license for the LPL mount is, it doesn't cost anything. Manufacturers just have to sign a piece of paper saying they'll make it robust enough. Um, because engineering, you know, Aries an engineering company and we have specs. <laughs> Uh, but otherwise, uh, the idea is that hopefully it ends up anywhere, and then anyone can use any PL mount lens or any future LPL mount lens. And there are more LPL mount lenses being released now. Uh, so we're, we're hopeful that this is a way forward that makes things a little bit easier for everyone. Stash, I know it's not a Fujinon product, but in your booth you have adapters. Can you tell us about those that take us, uh, well, I have some uh, Cabrios and they take me up to full frame? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have uh, from uh, our friends at Duclos and uh, Musashi in Japan uh, a series of expanders that enable you to use your Super 35 uh, lenses in the full frame environment. So these are designed to work um, with lenses that are T2 or, or slower. So, so they're not optimal on, on some of the faster primes that are out there, but certainly ideal for the zoom. So uh, there's a 1.7 times expander that enables you to take those premier HKs and, and fill out a 46.3 millimeter circle. 
Um, but um, what was a, a nice discovery is there's a 1.4 as well, where you're only going to lose one stop of light. With the illumination circle of a cabrio, that enables you to uh, to now, with just a 1.4 times expander, get that uh, same coverage. So, uh, really enabling you to use some of the lenses that you've you know that you currently own and that, that you've used over the years in these uh, large frame, uh, full frame uh, camera environments. So uh, I'm not sure who this is directed to. Maybe less, but uh, um, it seems like, with few exceptions, we're getting to this plateau now of uh, full frame, 24 by 36. Uh, but is it going to stop there? <laughs> is it going to keep going? How many cameras and lenses do I have to buy? I think uh, last year or the year before, when Winfred was here from uh, before he retired uh, from Zeiss. And he was, we were, we had this discussion going, and I said, you know, I hope I'm dead and buried by the time some of this comes out. It's, it seems that, um, you know, wearing, wearing my personal hat, I have a hard time understanding why we need full frame. Uh, wearing my manufacturer's hat, I love it. You know, <laughs> wow, another set of lenses. The market just doubled overnight. Um, but I think, you know, we're, we're seeing full frame. The adoption of full frame is certainly happening. I think it's happening slower than the manufacturers had thought because this was something that nobody, not a lot of people were asking for it. I think the camera guy said, shit, we've run out of, we've run out of Super 35 cameras to sell. What should we do now? And certainly 3D TVs didn't work, so we need something. <laughs> so we have full frame, and it's here to stay. And so wearing my Cook manufacturing hat, I love it. It um, has created a whole new section, of a whole new line of lenses for us, a whole new, all new opportunities and new looks for cinematographers. And I'm sure you'll find, you know, what's a, what is appropriate for your story. Super 35, full frame, anamorphic, <coughs> it'll all work out. And God, I hope we stop here. <laughs> You know, um, at least let us catch our breath before we go on to four by five or mid, you know, medium format cameras. I, I you know, it's it, the same argument is for Ks. You know, two K, four K, eight K. You know, I, I find that a, a marketing bullshit. Really, you uh, heard it here. Uh, <laughs> you know, if if the image works right for the story. It won't matter whether it's 1K image or a 27K image. And, and there's a lot to be said. You know, a lot of people talked here about how their lenses are warmer and less contrast. Well, you know what? We've been doing, cook, that's the cook look, you know? We've been doing that for years. And, it's, and, and uh, uh, last year when um, Thurston was introducing these lenses, I hit him on the shoulder, in fact, and said, you're building a cook lens. Thank you very much. So. The K's, you know, it, this is, uh, <laughs> I didn't see that. He was <laughs> kind of not agreeing. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, you know, I, I find this whole argument about K's, and, and uh, what I was getting to is that ultimate resolution doesn't necessarily make an Im image that anybody wants to watch. You know, what, what are they doing? They get these high res, the cameras are getting higher and higher res, and what are people doing? They're trying to put more diffusion, more stuff in front of it, to make it look cinematic, you know, make it look like an image somebody wants to see. And uh, I said it, I think, in this forum before, you got to let the story, I, I, the, the technology is wagging the dog. People are making choices. Oh, there's a new lens from Cook. There's a new lens from any one of us. I got to use it on my next feature. How do you know, you know? You haven't tested it. You haven't seen it. Oh, there's a new camera that shoots at three million, you know, pixels, like, or three million uh, re resolution. I got to have that. That's just crazy talk, you know. That people have forgotten. And I think a lot of people have forgotten. The story should drive those choices, and if you make the right choices and you have a compelling story, it'll all work. Anyway, that's my that's my soapbox. I'm sorry for taking so much no. time. Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah. We're here to talk about large formats, so if anybody wants to make a comment on that. Adam? Yeah, I'll make a comment. From the cinematographer's um, point of view. Yeah, it's just not about case. You know, it's latitude, it's color science. 
K just happened to be one of the equations. So uh, I know K's get a bad rap sometimes because we think, oh, it's just resolution, that's all we're after. We're actually after more than that. So uh, the K's do offer stuff to us, especially for VXF stuff. So, um, you know, it's just not the case. It's a combination of many things. Do you want uh, larger sensors? Do you I, want less depth of field? Uh, you know, for how, how sometimes, little? yeah, <laughs> yeah I, you know, less is right. Uh, it is about story, and that's just another tool. So um, we like tools. So thank you for making them. <laughs> I should mention, by the way, and somebody, I think you said that T2 is is standard speed, but in full frame, T2 is equivalent to super speed. You know, T2 is equivalent to 1.4 in Super 35. So these, these I don't know how anybody, I, I really feel sorry for focus pullers. <laughs> you know, it, if you're not, unless you're shooting a flat brick wall or a dead body, you cannot <laughs> hold focus at T2 in full frame. It's just not possible. So I feel sorry for these guys. I, I do have a customer down in South America, <coughs> and they're shooting full frame, and they like fast lenses. And, and I, uh, the guy said, how do you think our stuff looks? I said, I, I think it looks like shit, because people are weaving in and out of focus. He said, well, what will you do to fix that? I said, I put a screw in every lens, so you can't <laughs> go fa faster than T2.8. But uh, anyway. Sorry. <laughs> Christoph? Yeah, I <laughs> think uh, a couple of words about full frame. So I agree with you, less uh, perhaps no one, um, or, or perhaps we, we shouldn't go for, for bigger format. I think there is still one, uh, one big thing uh, that uh, full frame or large format or multiple format brought to cinematographer. Mm -hmm. And it's perhaps that before digital, you were experimenting with di different films, so no, People uh, got the digital cameras and suddenly say, oh God, I will shoot Super 35 on a digital sensor so it's the same look on the sensor for the rest of my life. And suddenly uh, there were some camera manufacturer read the first one uh, proposing different format on their camera and then suddenly cinematographers started to experiment and they found again something to experiment. So film disappeared with what do I experiment with the uh, sensor format. Yeah. And, 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 and then uh, the second thing that happened, and what is great for cinematographer, it's not great for the rental houses, I think, but it's like you have such a new choice of so many different lenses. So I think that uh, on this table, there would be perhaps half of the people here if we would have stayed with Super 35 because they would say, okay, we have a anyway, we have everything we need. We have Cook, we have Zeiss, we have uh, uh, Ari, uh, we have Ari, we have Ingenieur. Uh, what do I need more? But now with full frame, there is much choice. So everybody started to develop lenses, always completely different look. And uh, I think for cinematographer, it's simply a dream, right? Yeah. Well, Red deserves a lot of credit and a lot of blame. So, <laughs> or maybe that's the same thing. Uh, you wanted to say something about large yeah, format? Um, one other thing, uh, full frame, uh, we don't know. And uh, you know, my neighbor probably knows more because Harry is going to release a new camera next year. And it's going to be a Super 35 camera just after they announced a new camera that's full frame. So it's <laughs> uh, talking to rental house. A lot of people who have a Venus camera are renting it uh, mostly uh, for the Super 55 sensor uh, because of 4K, not, uh, or not for 6K. Uh, yeah, so for us, engineer, we had an approach to adapt the lens uh, for Super 55 or full frame with uh, what we call in, uh, interchangeable rear optics we have on the 12 time on the easy so you can uh, just put the optic that dedicated to the format so if you shoot super fit five that uh, we think that's going to be still the main format for a long time you can use the super 55 rear and if you want to shoot full frame you put the full frame rear but you lose uh, at least one stop so that's the challenge you need to put more light on the prime lenses, when we uh, started to talk to cinematographer about what we should do, uh, one of the comments was, oh, we, we want the lens to be fast, uh, but uh, you know, that, as Les mentioned, the challenge is really focusing. Uh, but uh, at the same time, when you have a fast lens, even if it's covered full frame, it covers also Super 45. So T18 was really a, 
in between like, you know, fast lens for Super 55 and fast lens for full frame. So that's why it would choose to be T18, uh, really, because people can use these lenses, this new prime, not only on their full frame cameras, but only on Super 55 camera. And they can create their own look on both uh, media. So, uh, you know, we'll know, we'll know next year what uh, the future will be, but uh, it's interesting for us. <laughs> well, speaking of choosing 1.8, Les, can you tell us why you chose a 1.8 squeeze for your anamorphics? You know, I can. <laughs> You've explained it to me before, and I was, I was doubting it. Okay. I was questioning it, and you, at IBC so, you explained it to me, and well, I want to share that with we, everybody. We, uh, when, we, when we undertook the full-frame anamorphics, uh, our, our, our th Super 35 anamorphics have been fantastically popular. We wanted to maintain that look and feel in, in the... Um, in the, in the full format, and as was said by Christoph, you know, now people are shooting films, they're shooting some in Super 35, they're shooting Super 16, they're shooting full, full frame, and it's all coming together and, and, and in the finished product. So we wanted to make the full frame anamorphics very similar to our Super 35 anamorphics. The problem is that the, super, the full frame is three by two instead of four by three. And if you're assuming that you're going to use a 2.4 release, which are 2.39 uh, release, what do you do? So if you keep a 2x squeeze, which is traditional anamorphic, you end up throwing around 20, 25% of the pixels away to crop down to a 2.4. If you want to use all the pixels in a full frame, you'd have a 1.6 squeeze. And we've had 1.6, 1.3. I guess we've had these lenses out around. I personally just don't think 1.6 is that anamorphic looking. It's sort of like, oh yeah, it's sort of maybe. It, I think it's a bad. It's a. It doesn't work for me. I mean, for you. so I said, let's do. Let's try 1.8. 1.8. It turns out is really sort of a sweet spot. If I show you pictures shot at 1.8. In uh, with the full frame and compare them to the same shot in with the the 2x Super 35 lenses, you're hard pressed to see a difference in the bokeh, and that's really where a lot of this comes out. Uh, the main difference is that in the in the 2x, the bokeh will start to go a little rectilinear at the extreme, whereas at the 1.8, it still stays nice and oval. Other than some DPs, we've shown it to DPs, some people think, wow, that's really cool, it's really nice. Other DPs say, I really want that rectilinear look as I get to the extremes. Well, you know, it's, it's a subjective choice. So, we re and we're only throwing away about 10% of the pixels to get to, if you're releasing in 2.4. But the really good news, and, I, and this is why I think 2.4 in Super 35, in anamorphic full frame is a dead format is that if you use all the pixels, and that's why we call them full frame plus, because we can cover the whole format, you get to a 2.7 ratio, which is if you, if you look at ultra panavision, which is 276, it's really a beautiful format. And I think you know people shooting in full frame anamorphic, 2.7 is, is gonna be a really pretty, pretty format to shoot in, assuming, going back to my rant earlier, that it fits for the story. Um, so we thought 1.8 was the, was the right sweet spot, giving you the most options um, and possibilities. So that's why we did 1.8. Okay. Uh, any other points? Yes. All right. So uh, I discovered something a little while back that uh, um, surprised me, and I, it kind of was kind of embarrassing that it took me so long to figure this out. But uh, I looked at, uh, I compared a 40 millimeter master anamorphic. Uh, and uh, let's see, I was shooting in UHD, which is what we recommend on the LF if you're shooting Super 35 uh, anamorphic, uh, to 2.39 open gate uh, with a spherical lens, and I think it was a 35 millimeter. I couldn't get them exactly matched at the time. So roughly the same angle of view, and the 35 millimeter uh, spherical lens was actually softer and I shot the window blinds in my living room. So I had a bunch of vertical lines all lined up. And when the anamorphic lens went out of focus, in you know, 40 millimeters, it goes out of focus that far vertically and that far horizontally. 
but the 35 millimeter goes out of focus the same amount in each dimension. So the vertical blinds actually looked softer at the same focal length in large format than in anamorphic, and that kind of surprised me. So I went out and I shot trees and all these other things. And sure enough, if you shoot spherical, you'll actually get a softer background uh, for the same angle of view at the same focal length, which is really interesting to me. So not to say that that's better, I'm more or less saying I'm kind of stupid for not figuring this out sooner, but it was really interesting to me because I always thought that anamorphic uh, was the way to go if you wanted a softer background, and it turns out large format is actually uh, competitive in this regard. Um, I'm very curious to see with large format anamorphic, it's going to be yet a different look, which I think is going to be really interesting. But you now have all these choices now with the large sensor. You can use as much of it or as little of it as you want and get a lens that will suit. And I would, uh, I would comment on, on your comment, and that is, that could be commenting on my comment, I guess I could go back. <laughs> I would say that I, I don't necessarily agree that anamorphic is supposed to be softer or this. Anamorphic is a strange animal. Uh, as, as was pointed out, you, you an anamorphic lens is basically a kludge. You know, you've taken... Uh, in this case, a 40 millimeter vertical lens, and you've pumped into it a 20 millimeter horizontal lens, gives you two depths of field. Uh, as you go around from horizontal to vertical, it uh, we've designed our lenses to be purposely distorted to get the, the give you that sort of traditional anamorphic look. Um, so I don't I don't necessarily think you shoot anamorphic just to get a little softer image. You shoot anamorphic because somebody's watching it. In the back of their brain, some, unless they're in the industry, you say, oh, that's anamorphic. But in the back of their brain somewhere, they're, they're thinking, huh, that's more interesting. That's different. I haven't, you know, I don't, I don't understand it, but it's, I, somewhere in their brain, they're just processing. It's a more interesting image to look at. And again, if it's right for the story, use it. If it's not, you've got, as has been mentioned up here countless times now, you've got tons of options. Tons of options. You used to use tons, you used to have a lot of film stocks. Now you, you know, you've got a chips and your, your, your options have sort of moved forward to the lens, which is where they belonged all the time. So anyway, thanks. One of the things I wanted to mention, since we do make cameras and lenses, yep. we do. <laughs> And, and, we made, and we made the first full frame. I apologize, two cameras that make cameras and lenses. Oh, right. um, and one of the things that's unique about our full frame C700 with, with both sets of our primes is that if you shoot um, full frame and your finish is uh, Super 35, you can, or you can capture Super 35 and you're oversampling. So you're capturing all of the 5.9K pixel area, but you're recording um, a, a Super 35. And the advantage to that is that um, you get a little bit better noise performance. You get a little bit better contrast performance. So I would say maybe we should call it Super Super 35. <laughs> Downsampling is always good. So uh, let's take some questions now. Uh What, what I was going to say is, seriously, is that you can use Resolve to do that. We've had a couple clients who wanted to add back a very, very subtle vignette when they're shooting full frame. Um, but uh, but I, would, I would say that um, you're absolutely right. I think um, when you look at the lens, I think the performance of a lens, and most of the lenses have a great performance in the center, and then they, they lose a bit on the corners. And I can for sure say that if you... It's always the best. If you shoot Super 35, I would use a Super 35 less. I think it's much better than to use any other glass. Um, of course, you can use it. always depends what you want. If you use our glass, where the Thalias, which have 60 millimeter image circle, and you use it on Super 35, you use the sweet, sweet spot, so you have an amazing picture. It's really there. But if you think about that, you want to have this Leica image that everybody's talking about. I think you'd rather go with a Summilux lens, which has exactly that fall off that you expect. And so, of course, we say that with our, all our glass, it's come as PL or LPL mount, and you can use it cross over all the cameras. But me specifically, I would always use the lens which fits the, the sensor it's made for. Even so, you can have all choices, I think. Um, you get the best out of the lens if you have also the, the typical thing that you lose something in the corners, which is probably a big part of the image you want to have. 
so while we're waiting, uh, if we don't have any questions, let's talk more about uh, metadata. So uh, I give, uh, no, Les doesn't know anything about metadata. And I give you all the credit for, for getting that going. But now, what is it that you're doing to extend the metadata? Oh, um, actually, so um, <coughs> what, what uh, we remarked, but also uh, Les and his team remarked as well, is that um, what would be very, what is very, let's say, what doesn't bring any added value in the whole workflow but costs a lot of time is uh, when the guys in the VFX, uh, when they need to um, remove the distortion, to apply the CGI, to make the compositing and then reapply the distortion, uh, working with the distortion, because basically no one wants to correct any distortion or any shading or vignetting. We just <laughs> talked about this. It's very nice, right? Um, so, so basically, it's a, these are steps in in this whole um, uh, VFX workflow that are not bringing any that value, cost time, uh, cost money, and people say all the time, especially the VFX artists. To be honest, not really the, the DOPs, but they say, "Can you bring us a way to do this without all those steps?" And the way to go is add. You, you know, we are a lens manufacturer, we know how our lens are and we can measure them. Why don't you put electronically in the lens those data of distortion, of vignetting, so that whenever I need to do a compositing uh, or I need to apply this distortion, this vignetting, I want to have the same characteristic on my CGI, I don't need to make uh, a lot of, of steps and shoot grids before and try to uh, put some slider in nuke and move them and until my uh, my my image match. So basically, this data are in the lens. You can record them. You can pass them to the VFX, and then they can just with one click uh, apply the the same characteristic as you have in the lens on your CGI. And uh, our solution is a bit. I, I mean, it does the same as uh, the Cook IQ but a bit different from the technical implementation. So there are two different options. And by the way, it's part also, uh, so less accepted to integrate this in, into the, uh, the Cook uh, slash IQ specification so uh, everybody can implement them freely. Yeah, Les has been giving this away for 20 years. He's been uh, pushing this. It's just now coming into the fore. As a matter of fact, I was just doing a, uh, an interview with the lighting company, and they said that they're going to start putting their uh, metadata from lighting the set onto the camera. So what's the future of uh, metadata? Great question. As I said earlier, I really think I've thought this for 20 years. You know, I've thought this is the moment where metadata is going to arrive and people are going to say, yeah, we can't shoot with it, shoot without it. And uh, I think we're really there. I really do think we're, we're at the point that either the industry grabs it and works with it, or we say, that's it, we're done. I mean, uh, what, uh, what Christoph was talking about is the distortion modeling, which is, they use what's called extended data, which he's quite right, we, we put that into the iSpec. We use a different system for doing the same work, um, called i3, um, but the, the, they result in more or less this, the same things to the user, and that is the ability to quickly undistort the image. Uh, and as, as Christoph said, this is really the tracking and undistortion is really non-artistic but time-consuming. So if we can cut that time down, then they can use that money. Well, being producers, they'll probably put the money in their pocket. But they could use the money for artistic means. So I think we're there. Uh, and we're at the point where the industry will either accept it or I, or I think, uh, you know, or as I said, I think we're done. Uh, we've invested 20 years, millions and millions of pounds to get to where we are. We've given the system away purposely so it would become a standard in the industry because if it's not a standard, nobody will use it. And, you know, Aries, Aries has their system, but they're also I-compatible. I uh, Ingenue and their new stuff is going to, you said, is putting it. Zeiss is doing it. We're doing it. Fujinon's a partner, Canon's a partner, but they just don't always do it. Not on this one. Not on this one. Uh, and and uh, 
most of these guys are partners, whether they're implementing it or not. I think they're maybe sitting on the sidelines waiting to see if it's worth the money to implement it. So I think we're there. The next year or two will tell. Um, yeah, the next year or two to, will tell for sure. And I, I think it's going to be adopted and because we can save, we have the potential to save the industry lots and lots of money, which, you know, that's usually music to uh, So they can give me a raise. Years. Yeah. <laughs> Christoph, you had something to add? More lenses. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps also an, another application, and, and I think this is really uh, the future of cinematography. We talk about virtual production, right? So basically, nowadays, uh, when you shoot green screen, uh, you want to, to uh, embed uh, the, the computer graphics uh, live. Uh, currently, we are still in the phase of using this for pre-visualization so that the DOP or the director sees if the uh, actors are placed correctly and you have uh, a way. But, but there are already shows that integrate this uh, directly in the camera, and, and for this, there are some systems like MOSIS or NCAM. When they want to use this system, they need to measure the lens. It takes like, the, the NCAM guys told me like it can take like half a day just to characterize the lens so that the system works. And I think we know how our uh, lenses behave, what are exactly the data, so why don't we put them in the lens so that those guys don't spend half a day measuring a lens in the pre-production uh, just to uh, make this uh, systems, which is basically the future of cinematography work. So I would, I would point out uh, what he said is correct. They spend time you know, shooting grids, and they're never going to be as accurate as the information that we can put in the lens at the factory. Uh, they, they shoot two or three grids, they do an ex extrapolation to come out with what, it, what, what it's supposed to be. They don't know all the internal workings of the lens that go into distortion mapping. We do. Zeiss does. Every manufacturer up here will know the inner workings of their lens. So the, so the distortion map that we publish or pu put in the lens is going to be far more accurate that they can shoot a grid. So. It's a win-win, other than the guy that gets paid for half a day. He's, you know, <laughs> that is not a win for him. Michael, you wanted to add something? Yeah, the other, the other area where it, it may not go away if it doesn't take off is computational um, cinematography, which is coming where you're capturing from multiple cameras, multiple lenses, and it kind of ties into what you were talking about, the, um, what NCAM is doing. So where you're taking the lens is just capturing raw data, and the actual image is made in a computer. And that information about the distortion and all the metadata is important for the computational uh, photography. That doesn't sound as much fun to be a cinematographer in that world. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Robots making movies. <laughs> I should, uh, we, we, we do read uh, slash eye on our cameras. I should also mention, though, that we have LDS and LDS2. Uh, LDS2 is our uh, latest protocol that will record frame accurate information up to 150 frames a second, I think, is the, the top end. Uh, we're looking at doing uh, chromatic aberration and distortion uh, mapping and making that available for visual effects. But uh, we have primarily put our efforts into making lenses that don't really require that. So uh, it's coming. But uh, we're trying to make really good lenses that don't really require that with a, more of a classic look, but without so much distortion and chromatic aberration. Well, I think it's time for our thank yous now. We didn't get many audience <laughs> questions, but whatever. Um, I'd like to thank um, uh, Jean-Marc Bouchou, Art Adams, Michael Bravin, Les Zellin, Stas Durbans, uh, Reiner Herscher, uh, Anna Piffle, uh, Adam Beck, Jared Ivey, uh, Ryan Avery, and Christoph Kazanov and uh, our volunteer crew. Thank and you thank all, you, thank you thank all you. for coming. Thank you.